let's take a look at Earth's energy balance and the greenhouse effect. So if we're going to look at the Earth's energy balance, we have to start out with the Sun. The Sun is very close to being a black body radiator. It's not perfect, but it's pretty darn close. Most of the Sun's radiation doesn't impact the Earth. If the Earth is over here, only part of that solar radiation will reach the Earth. So we define something called the solar constant, which is the solar energy of all wavelengths that's incident per area, per time, at the mean distance of the Earth from the Sun. Another way to say that is the solar constant is the amount of power received per square meter at the mean distance of the Earth from the Sun. And the solar constant is approximately equal to 1400 watts per square meter. So an object at the mean distance of the Earth from the Sun that's directly facing the Sun will receive a power of 1400 watts for every square meter directly facing the Sun. Now we're also going to define something called an albedo. The albedo is the fraction of radiation reflected by a surface. So the albedo, which is often represented with the letter A, sometimes alpha, is equal to the energy that's reflected by the surface divided by the energy incident upon the surface. So for instance, ice has an albedo of about 0.9, 90% of the radiation that's incident upon ice is reflected back. The ocean has an albedo of about 0.06, it's quite low. So only 6% of the radiation incident upon the ocean is reflected back. And forest in general, your average forest, has an albedo of about 0.2. Now before we go any further, I want to point out that if the albedo is the fraction that's reflected, then the rest of the energy must be absorbed. Because if you have energy coming into a surface, well that energy either has to be reflected from the surface, or it has to be absorbed by the surface. Energy can't be created or destroyed, so it either has to go in or come out. So if the albedo is the fraction that's reflected, then 1 minus the albedo is the fraction that's absorbed by the surface. That'll be useful in a moment. Now let's look specifically at Earth's energy balance. And we'll start out by saying that the Earth is in thermal equilibrium, or at least very close to thermal equilibrium. The Earth's temperature is not drastically changing very quickly. Uh, so, if it's in thermal equilibrium, then that means that the power that's being absorbed by the Earth, so the power that's coming into the Earth from the Sun, has to equal the power that's emitted by the Earth through thermal radiation. So, the power coming in has to equal the power going out, if it's in thermal equilibrium. Now let's try to write down an expression for the power that's absorbed by the Earth. So the power that's absorbed by the Earth would equal the power that's incident on the Earth from the Sun per area, which is the solar constant, times the area of the Earth that's facing the Sun, which is pi r squared, where r is the radius of the Earth, times 1 minus the albedo of the Earth because 1 minus the albedo is the fraction of the power that's absorbed by the Earth's surface. So that combination gives us the power that's absorbed by the Earth. And that has to equal the power that's emitted by the Earth. And the Earth is approximately a black body, so we can say sigma a t to the fourth using the Stefan Boltzmann law. So a is equal to the total surface area of the Earth because the entire surface area of the Earth is emitting radiation, and T is the temperature of the Earth's surface. So let's see, we can write down that the area, the total surface area of the Earth is 4 pi r squared, so if we do that, then let's see, pi's cancel out, the radius of the Earth cancels out, and we're left with the solar constant times 1 minus the albedo of the Earth is equal to 4 sigma t to the fourth. And so let's solve for the temperature. The temperature then is equal to the fourth root of the solar constant times 1 minus the albedo of the Earth divided by 4 sigma. Using this expression, we can determine what the temperature of the Earth should be. 
We know the solar constant is about 1360 watts per square meter. That's in your data booklet. We can get a good estimate of the albedo of the Earth, and then sigma is just a constant. So if we do that, we solve for the temperature, you'll find that the temperature of the Earth is equal to 255 Kelvin, or about negative 18 degrees Celsius. Now, wait a minute. That's not true. <laughs> the average temperature of the Earth is not negative 18 degrees Celsius. That's far colder than the Earth. So what has gone wrong in our model here? Well, what went wrong is that Earth has an atmosphere. A temperature of negative 18 degrees Celsius is roughly the average temperature of the moon. And the moon has no atmosphere, but is approximately the same distance from the sun. Now it's a little bit different because the moon has a slightly different albedo. But the big difference is that Earth has an atmosphere, and that strongly affects the average temperature of the Earth. And one of the primary ways that the atmosphere affects the temperature of the Earth is by the greenhouse effect. So the Earth's atmosphere contains many different gases. But one category of gases in the atmosphere is greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases, or GHGs, are gases which absorb infrared light, but do not absorb visible light. So examples of greenhouse gases are carbon dioxide, water vapor, methane, and nitrous oxide. Now, most of the atmosphere is not greenhouse gases. Most of the atmosphere is diatomic nitrogen, diatomic oxygen, but those don't absorb either visible or infrared light in any great quantities, so we kind of put those to the side. Now, let's take a moment to look back at the black body curves for the sun and the earth. So, the sun is at a very high temperature, about 5800 Kelvin on its surface, and the earth has a temperature of about 300 Kelvin on its surface. So, looking at the black body curve of the sun, the sun emits the vast majority of its power as visible light. The Earth, however, has a much lower temperature, and so it emits most of its power as infrared light. So, the Sun emits most of its power as visible light, the Earth emits most of its power as infrared light. Knowing that, let's draw a little diagram of the Earth's surface and the atmosphere and think about how the incoming light from the Sun and the outgoing light from the Earth Will interact with that. So the incoming sunlight, the light coming in from the sun, that is visible light. So it just passes through the atmosphere. The greenhouse gases don't interact with the incoming sunlight because it's visible light. At the Earth's surface, some of the incoming sunlight is reflected back into space because the Earth has an albedo. But about 70% of the incoming sunlight is absorbed by the Earth. Okay. The Earth emits mostly infrared light. So the Earth's surface has outgoing infrared light because it's at about 300 Kelvin. As it leaves the Earth's surface, it has to pass through the atmosphere, which contains greenhouse gases. These greenhouse gases absorb the infrared light. They absorb the infrared light, and some of it is then sent back down to the Earth. Some of it is also emitted into space. It's, in fact, emitted in all directions. But that means that some of that infrared light absorbed by the greenhouse gases is emitted back down to the Earth. That means that it's absorbed, again, by the Earth. If the Earth receives more radiation, the Earth's temperature will increase. That's the idea behind the greenhouse effect. Greenhouse gases are naturally occurring in the Earth's atmosphere. The existence of these natural greenhouse gases increases the temperature of the Earth from what we'd expect, about 255 Kelvin, to 290 Kelvin. That's a good thing. It allows for liquid water to exist on much of the Earth's surface, and it keeps the surface conditions of the Earth favorable for life as we know it. However, human fossil fuel use and deforestation have both caused an increase in carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere. We're going to focus more on carbon dioxide. So for example, in 1750, 
there were about 280 carbon dioxide molecules per million molecules in the atmosphere. We usually say PPM, parts per million. As of 2015, the average was about 400 carbon dioxide molecules per million, or 400 ppm. And over time, this has been steadily increasing. An increase in the greenhouse gases present in the atmosphere causes an enhanced greenhouse effect, a greater greenhouse effect, which in turn increases the average temperature of the Earth. Now that is a pretty simplified view of the Earth system and the Earth's energy balance, and in reality, there are many, many complicated systems that are interacting when we talk about the Earth's system. For example, if the enhanced greenhouse effect caused an increase in the average temperature of the Earth, we would expect there to be less ice at the poles. And if there's less ice at the poles, that means that there would be a lower albedo of the Earth, because there'd be less ice to reflect the sunlight. And that would mean that there would be more sunlight absorbed by the Earth, and we would have a higher temperature of the Earth, which means that there would be even less ice at the poles and a lower albedo and more sunlight abs absorbed and an even higher temperature. And we get a feedback. In fact, this is called the ice albedo feedback. Also, if we were to have a higher temperature in the ocean, then oceans turns out, due to their chemistry, cannot absorb as much carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And if the oceans are not absorbing as much carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, then more carbon dioxide will be left in the atmosphere, which will mean a uh, greater enhanced greenhouse effect, which will in turn cause a higher temperature in the ocean, which means that the oceans cannot absorb as much carbon dioxide, which means more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, greater greenhouse effect, higher temperature. And again, we get a feedback loop. Last one we'll look at is if we have more heat at the surface. More heat at the surface is going to change wind patterns. And we saw ways that that can happen when we looked at convection and sea breezes and the convection currents around the Earth. Well, if you change those wind patterns, then you're going to change the local climates on the Earth. And one big effect that's expected is to create larger extremes in weather patterns. So the idea that increasing the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere will cause an enhanced greenhouse effect and increase the average temperature of the Earth, that is very well accepted science, and the evidence of this has been observed over the past few decades as Earth's average temperature has steadily increased. But the details of exactly how the enhanced greenhouse effect will affect the world on a regional scale or on local scales is a much more difficult question, which is still very much an active area of investigation.